Broadcast, we're on. Woo. Hello, awesome passport members. How are you? Uh, Trey Reckliff here. Here's Tane. What's going on, Tane? Hey, everybody. Uh, our new assistant, and I've got uh, Stu on the line too. How are you, Stu? Hi, I'm good. Just sitting in the dark for atmosphere. <laughs> sitting in the dark in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, Stu is the guy that just doesn't do support. He does about a million things around Second Customs. So thank you. Anyway, guys, thanks, and welcome to uh, a little passport Q&A thing. I thought I would concentrate on talking about this new camera. This is the Sony a7R Mark III, and in particular, about this new lens. Okay, this isn't like a real review. These are early impressions. I've been shooting with it for a little bit now, and I've got some hot opinions on it, quite unsuspected. In fact, it may... It may even go so far as replacing my Hasselblad. I'm not going to say anything so bombastic immediately, but I'll, I'll get into that. So I was going to talk a little bit about this camera. I was going to show some sample images. And at the end of this, I was going to do a, a photo edit, OK, uh, using Aurora, a little HDR photo edit, uh, using some photos that I took right out of this bad boy. Um, yeah, and if you like these live broadcasts, uh, let me know. Uh, we can certainly do more of them. Uh, we could take your questions live right now, uh, live on this YouTube uh, contraption. I've got my Bob Ross shirt on for you guys. Keeping it real here. Um, so yeah, let me just get right into it, start talking about this thing right away. Uh, so you guys may know uh, that I have been, um, uh, going back and forth between the Hasselblad and the Sony. In fact, in Japan, I would say I shot about 60, 65% of my shots with the Hasselblad and the rest with the Sony. Just because the Sony is so much faster and in a lot of ways easier to use and more flexible. Okay. Um, I've got a big trip coming up now across Florida and the, um, uh, and the Caribbean. Which I'm excited about, and so really I'm going to be taking both systems there along. But I can already foresee myself using this quite a bit. Um, so if you can't tell, my first impressions are that I am very impressed. Good job, Sony. You guys are awesome. Um, it's basically it feels the exact same as the A7R Mark II and the Mark One. Yeah, like, you know, every single iPhone is basically the same, <laughs> so it feels like that. Um, I can tell, though, that it is faster. Like, yeah, I, can, I can just feel like it's faster, the software updates. It just seems smarter. There's a lot more menu options inside. Um, now there's like a favorites menu option, which is handy. Um, it does do one unusual thing in the EVF, and... Stu, tell me if you if you heard about anything about this. Stu actually knows much more technical stuff than I do about this camera. But in between each shot, it flashes white, you know, almost like an old tiny photo booth kind of thing. Almost like it, it's uh, it's kind of a cool effect, but it's almost like a special effect, you know. Before it would just show the image that you just took for like half a second, or like even a, you know a quarter second before it showed the next one. Now you don't quite do that. The other thing that I noticed is that when you're reviewing the images, uh, you know, when you press play and you start going through the images here, um, oh, I'm, I have no memory card in there right now. Don't worry, I'm a professional. But when you, here, this is, this is what assistants are for. Put, put a card in there, Tani. <laughs> um, when you take photos and you're viewing them, it groups them into like little piles. So you might have like a pile of four photos and a pile of 20 photos. It can recognize similar photos that are kind of burst together. And so like the review experience is a little bit different and a little bit more elegant, I think. So this, uh, this lens that I have on here, let me see if I can get some amazing, look, some of my best work. Look at that, incredible. So then I do something like that, then I'll take some uh, photos of you on YouTube. And then when you press play, you can kind of see how there's like little bunches, right? It goes through different bunches of photos. Uh, you can kind of see them there in like a pile. 
there's photos from my kids um little dance recital thing and then once you click on them you go inside and you look through that little pile okay so kind of neat i guess um so but really i want to talk about this lens this is the 24 to 105 g master lens right these are like the real hardcore pro lenses and at first i thought well it couldn't be that great i'm always very skeptical of, of everything but i was wrong this is a great lens and i can see myself shooting with this this might be my main my main lens my main lens used to be the 24 to 240 because i love the flexibility but this is just a much higher quality lens i can see it i can see in the results i'll show you also and honestly, I would say when I had on the 24 to 240, most of my shots were still under 100 millimeters because, you know, I tend to go pretty wide. And so if I need to go longer than that, if I need to go longer, I'll just swap on the other lens. Uh, so it's great. The other new lens I got, which I have not tried yet, is this one. Uh, this is the, this is another G Master. See a little red G. Uh, 16 to 35. Haven't tried it yet, but I assume it's going to be as unbelievable as this one. So then that makes you wonder, makes me wonder, uh, where does this fall into play? This is my other favorite new lens. This is the Sony 12 to 24. Um, so this is like super wide, right? My plan basically is to use this one all the time, except for when I need that 12 to 16 range, then I'll throw in this one. That's my plan. That's my plan of attack. Not all plans, uh, battle plans, go to work when you start going to war, but that's my battle plan, at least. Okay, let me share my screen and show you some um, results, okay, well, from this that, machine. Right. Yes. Um, I have two questions about the viewfinder, or two theories, suggestions, I don't know what I would call them. But the first one is that they mentioned in the in the in all the tech nonsense, slash 100 fps so it might be worth or whether it's just they select and you don't get any control the other thing is they they say there's a high quality mode and a normal quality mode for the viewfinder so again switch it and see if that white flash disappears depending on what you choose awesome good advice i will try that um Stu is totally the uh the total geek about this stuff so he gives me all kinds of good Good advice. The other thing that I want to try on it, which I haven't tried yet, is you. It has silent shooting mode, which is cool. But before you couldn't do silent shooting mode, and do bracketing with a timer. For some reason, those things were mutually exclu exclusive. You couldn't do one or the other. But now, if you can't do silent shooting all the time with auto bracketing with a timer, I will do it. Oh, this has this other feature that I haven't tested yet, but I will test it and get back to you. It does this thing, which took me a while to understand, where it takes four photos. And between each photo, it takes the, the sensor and shifts it by one pixel. So it makes a little square, right? And then it combines all those photos into one. And you have to use some special Sony software on your computer in order to like merge these together before you get into Lightroom. So that's another can of worms I haven't opened up yet. Um, you have you got to be on a tripod or shooting something still. I don't know if it works for like a landscape. Maybe um, It might be weird if the clouds are moving or some trees or grasses are moving. I Don't I don't really know but that's I'll cross that Rubicon when I come to it. Okay, I'll share my screen here share my whole my entire screen. I'll show you some sample photos From this bad boy, okay let me open up uh, Lightroom here. Okay, now these these are all uh, right out of the camera, okay? Right out of the camera with no adjustments. These are just right in Lightroom. And I'll kind of show you, you might find it interesting, my methodology for testing cameras, right? Okay, so Tony and I jumped in his jalape here. Uh, Oh, by the way, thank you guys for being Passport members. You guys are awesome. Uh, 
you can always get another passport or a loved one or a friend for Christmas. It's Christmas shopping time. And one reason I just thought of this is because we made a 360 video on the way out here for early testing. And we're going to release this video to passport members either tomorrow or the next day because Stu is editing it together right now. So you get to go with us yeah. on this little adventure. And uh, you see me testing the camera and that kind of stuff. OK, so here's Tane. This is his dad's uh, old Land Rover. What is that, Tane, 1969 Land Rover? I think it's a 67 Land Rover. 67. Mm -hmm. um, so first, I did sort of an establishing shot here. OK, this is shot at F10. OK, so everything's in focus. As you can see, he's in focus. Uh, mountains are in focus. Everything looks good. Super sharp. Right now, I'm zooming into, I think, just 100%. But you can just see the sharpness is just incredible. Um, so that's that shot. So it's sort of an establishing shot. And then I dropped it down to F4 and I got three other shots. Okay. Because I want to I want to see, let me just show you quickly what they're this one, uh, this one, and this one. Okay. So I like to do kind of one at a, a normal focal length and one as wide as possible and then uh, one a little tighter. So this is as wide as possible right here, okay? This is all at 24 millimeters, okay? At F4. So we can see that uh, Tane here is in perfect focus with his chiseled visage. And you can see that the background is a beautiful bouquet out there. You always think, oh, F4, F4 is not gonna make a nice bouquet. It does, it's great, look at that. And remember, this is at its widest setting. Wait till you see it at 105. And then also, it's so nice and wide that the front of the Defender over here is out of focus. So that looks nice. That's always a nice effect to me when you do something with bokeh, to have something in the middle in focus, and then uh, foreground out of focus, background out of focus. And you can kind of see here as we go along, uh, his, uh, his shoulder is in focus, and then his hairy man arm is not so in focus. And it, the focus kind of falls away towards the end of Defender in a really lovely way, right? Okay, so that's all the way wide. Uh, this one is a little tighter, okay? Um, actually, no, that's not true. This is also 24 millimeter. I just got closer to him, okay? So you can see how sharp it is. This is all autofocus, did a great job. And the last one is my favorite. This is at 105, fully zoomed in, okay? And look at that amazing bouquet on that background and in the foreground, right? And then we can zoom in on him and see that he is uh, perfectly in focus. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Looking so severe there. Right, okay, so those are camera, those are shots right out of the camera. Okay, oh, here's one more. Let me show you this one. This is um, this is a head-on shot at 24 millimeter. I can zoom in here and see uh, everything's perfectly in focus. And then also, if you go up here, you can see that the mountains are nicely out of focus. It's great. It's almost like a medium format kind of shot to get this kind of effect. It's really hard to get like wide angle bouquet action. Um, you know, like you thought, you know, you I would think like I'd have to shoot at F 2.8 or something to get this, but I think it looks really great. Um, and so here, let me just do a few adjustments on this shot, okay? Uh, just to just to make it look a little bit better. Here, I'll go into the develop module and uh, pull up the shadows. Here, uh, pull up the blacks a little bit, maybe increase a little bit of vibrance, a little bit of contrast there. And then if we zoom in, I mean, how cool does that look? Let me zoom into um, two to one. Uh, there we go, just like super zoom in. Look at that. Oh, look at Tani, he's just staring bullets into you. It's like looking at the eclipse, isn't it? You gotta, I advise if you guys watch this that you you poke a hole in a shoebox or something and look at the look at the shadow. Tony. <laughs> um, yeah, and here's another one. I ran one of my presets on this one. This is this is not even Tony posing. This is actually him just pulling into position. Um, <laughs> cool photo though, isn't it? Pull it up. I like it. Uh, and then I actually did edit a few photos too, full edits of uh, some of these final ones. Here they are. Um, this is a full edit of. Um, oops. Oops, I didn't mean to make this. Oh yeah, we'll bring it into Photoshop here so you can see. I'll zoom in. And we'll do an HDR edit here after, after a moment too. 
Um, so here's the final version of this one. I kind of HDR'd it up a little bit. We can zoom in here and you can see all the nice details of the truck and everything. Good. Um, yeah, just, I mean, just easy. This is just a single raw file, by the way. Single raw file. I do a lot, I would say I do over half of my HDR shots now with a single raw file. Here, let's edit this one. Or let me double click on it. This is it after the final edit. See, I think it looks a little bit better HDR'd up. See all the nice details there on the Land Rover. And this, this is a cool car too because the, the, the driver or the, uh, the windshield, it folds down forward. Totally not street legal, but very cool. You can see the nice background, all the nice colors. Oh, yeah. Great. I mean, what a machine. What a machine. Okay. Uh, and I'm talking about the camera, not Tane. Okay. Um, let's do a little edit here together, shall we? Before okay. you do that, Trey, um, yeah. we do have one question that's a little bit off topic for just now, so you can have a think about it while you're processing. But um, one of the people in the Q&A would like you to just talk a little bit about how you put panoramas together. Um, sure. Because they know you've got a few huge ones. So what's your thought process for panoramas? Just think that yeah. through while you're processing. Of um, let me just go ahead and click check alignment here. Um, and let that thing process for a minute. Um, let me stop screen sharing and talk to the camera. Um, my process for panoramas um, is pretty um, cool. <laughs> it's a little different than what I see most people do. In fact, we have a passport exclusive coming up. I'm not sure which day. Tana, you might know. We, we plan out these passport things um, in the future. Maybe in a week or so, but I'm gonna I'm gonna showing how I'm actually showing how I do my new my new panorama technique. In short, let me just try to describe it. Um, I take all the parts of the photo, I mean all the all the pieces of the photo, and then I process them in Lightroom. Okay, I try to make them look good in Lightroom. Okay, and then I take all of them and I load them into Photoshop as layers. I don't merge to panorama in Lightroom. And I don't merge to panorama in, in Photoshop, but I just load them as layers, okay? And then I select all the layers and I do an auto align and it kind of lay, layers them up on top of each other, okay? And you see like really hard seams between them, okay? And then what I do is I start masking, okay? So I just take a, a brush with a big brush with a soft edge and just go right down the seam. Okay, and it makes a really smooth uh, transition. Okay, and this to me is the best method for making panoramas now. Uh, it's a little bit more manual, takes a little more time consuming, but I find the computer often makes bad decisions, and I don't really like the seams that it does either. Um, anyway, you'll see this coming up. By the way, I really want to thank you guys again for being passport members. I think last year we released over 50 different videos just for you guys. And if you haven't seen them yet, be sure you start watching the new Antarctica videos that we're just releasing just to you Passport members. They're fun. They're really funny. I think three of three has the most photo tips kind of stuff. The other two are just kind of behind the scenes, fun stuff. How many of those have we released, um, Stu? Uh, yeah. Two so far. And the next one, which is my favorite so far as well, is on, the, on Christmas Eve, I think, on Sunday. Christmas Eve, right. That's the one about the penguin sex, right? It is the one about the penguin sex and how to photograph penguin sex. That's right. We're going to get people in the Christmas spirit by talking about penguin um, porn. Penguin porn. So we're always looking at new and exciting ways to titillate the crowd. Stu. Okay. Let me share my screen again and then I'll edit this photo. Uh, share screen. Share entire screen. Okay. Here we go. Now, uh, let me show you the component photos that went into this, OK? Um, these are three were taken with the A7R Mark III in the same lens, OK? One, two, three. Handheld. I just do handheld in the daytime. You can see they're not very well aligned. But Aurora does a great job in aligning them. And you know, I know I just said that I 
I uh, typically just use one raw. Well, I could have used one raw here and ended up with pretty much the exact same result. But I was testing the auto bracketing, and you know, why not? What I did then, by the way, is I took the three photos out of Lightroom and I exported them here as JPEGs. Okay? Yeah, I could have taken the three RAWs, but I find the three JPEGs to be just as good. Okay? So here we are in Aurora, and you can see it's already done something, right? And it already looks amazing. Look at that. It's just done. <laughs> I'll play with it a little bit more. You know, I don't want to overcook it, but you can see it already looks great. Amazing. Really. This is why we won Max App of the Year, because of this awesome magic that happens to it. Okay. Here, let's turn that off. Overall, before and after, before and after. We'll just tweak it out a little bit more. Okay. Um, I guess now I'm going to start thinking about, okay, what, what do I want to change? Okay. I might want to make the sky a little softer, a little more glowy, a little more summery. I might want to make the mountains look even sharper. Okay. Even a little sharper. Okay. With a, a little more texture, right? And then the hills down here, I might want to make those a little softer, a little greener. A little more summary, okay? So let's start at the top and work down. Okay, so I'll make a new layer here, a new adjustment layer. And now I'm gonna do a little HDR enhance to maybe make it look a little more HDR-ish up there, a little smart tone. Um, a little bit of vibe, nah, it looks none of that. Maybe I'll, a little bit to brighten up the sky. I don't think there's any noise up there, but that'll just soften it a little with the denoise. Little image radiance. There we go. Now I'm going to click this. This is a slightly new thing now. With you click the brush. Now you have three choices or four choices in here: brush, radial mask, or um, gradient mask for luminosity. I wonder if people can see when I zoom in like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I click brush. Make my brush a little bigger, and now just kind of paint in the sky. Okay. Do you do like a summer sky to be like a little bit willowy, you know, a little dreamy? At least I do, okay. Because uh, you don't want it to be all textury and, and hard like the mountains, because these are two different things. Okay, now let's play with the mountains. Okay, so I'll do a little HDR enhance. Um, I will do a little bit of HDR structure. Okay, ooh. Okay, I'm gonna drop down the softness a little bit, increase the boost. Yeah, that's really making the uh, mountains look nice and crunchy. Probably a little too crunchy, but I'll drop down my opacity here on the brush. Let me do the brush. Oh, I already have the brush. I'll drop down the opacity of 50% and just kind of start painting through a little bit here. Mountains. Be a little inconsistent. Inconsistent, that's cool. The other thing some people do, I don't do it, is you know, the mountains are quite blue. They're reading quite blue, right? That's because there's just a lot of you know, nitrogen molecules between me and the mountains that are splitting the sunlight into the blue spectrum. That's, that's why distant mountains look blue. And it does give them a sense of scale in a way, because the further away they are, the bluer they are. But if you wanted to, you could always drop down the saturation, right? And make them a little bit more gray, or brown if you wanted to. Um, I might do that a little bit, just a little bit. All right, cool, looking good. Nice and crunchy. Okay, now, if you want to see where I painted, by the way, I'll turn on the mask. See, I just kind of plopped it around there. A little inconsistent. Don't have to go right up to the edges or anything. And also, by kind of splotting it around like that, it gives you an area to have some transitions, like from extreme, from light HDR to more extreme HDR. Now, the best way to make the ground warmer is to add a little bit of contrast here. Okay. A little bit of smart tone because we did darken up those trees a little bit. Um, image radiance is a really nice way to make it warmer down there. Pull up those shadows. And then maybe increase the warmth here a little bit. There we go. Much warmer ground. And I'll start painting on the ground. That's good. The other thing that I might do, which I can't do in uh, in... Aurora, unfortunately, is I might get rid of a few things on the ground. Like, let me zoom in here so you can see. Uh, let me zoom into like 
I don't know, 50% or 100%. Let me just go for it. 100%. Um, so like, I don't really like this house down here with a blue, like these these other primary color things that are jumping in there, kind of giving me the blues. So I might get rid of those and some of these light poles and these blue tanks. Things that really grab your eye, you know, and are a little too contrasty or alarming. I don't I don't really like having those in there. It takes us back to fit to screen. There we go. Let's look at a uh, an overall before and after. Uh, before after. Awesome. And you know, really, it I didn't make that many adjustments, and part of it might be because that raw image that came out of the Sony was just so good with that lens. It came off already very sharp and vibrant, you know. So made some little adjustments here. Yeah, so we good. have a few questions, Trey, in the chat. Um, sure. One about Aurora that I don't know the answer to, and hopefully you do. Um, so Mark Dodd was asking. Um, he knows that you can add uh, an image as a layer in Aurora. Um, so when, if you were to take another image of this scene and add it in, does it auto align that new layer or do you have to? No, it won't, Aurora? right. So if I were to go here, hit plus new uh, image layer or new, now you can say new original image layer or one of the bracket layers, it will not um, align it, sadly. It will not align it, so that's that is a problem. But it's not very often that 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 happens. I don't think. Not too often does that happen. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good question, Mark Dodd. Next question um, from Cats Steel. Um, do you ever use ND filters for water effects or anything else? And would you create a tutorial on how you print your images? So two questions. The first ND filters. Second tutorial about printing. Right. Um, I never used an ND filter, but I just bought one, um, actually. Oh, I've got a hot tip for you Passport members. Hot tip. And I'll have Stu get you the link and put it in the, in the show notes. By the way, this show, we're going to put on the blog tomorrow, okay, just for Passport members, right? But I'll have him add this to notes. So I got a, I'm getting an, another new toy. I'm getting a new lens. It's a, um, it's a uh, so no, it's it's a, a Leica attachment lens. I think yeah, Leica attachment lens. It's not a Leica lens, but it's a 0 0.95 f. It's a 50 millimeter f 0 0.95. And Leica makes one of these, but it's a twelve thousand dollar lens, and I'm too cheap to buy that. But someone showed up at my um, Tokyo event, at the Tokyo Photo Walk, and he had one, and it was like a Chinese knockoff. So, and it's much cheaper. Um, so, and it might be shitty, but it might be awesome. His was awesome. The bouquet was unbelievable. And so the thing is, with an F0.95 lens, it's so bright, you can't even shoot with it wide open in the daytime. So I got um, like an ND4 to attach to it. So I'll put that on there for shooting in the daytime. But normally I never shoot with any, any ND filters. I'm just kind of lazy, really. And, um, and I'm always getting new lenses, you know, and you need different ND lenses, like screw types for different. And I just, I don't want to carry all that stuff around and I find it to be kind of expensive. I, if I did it, I would use it for really long exposure stuff. Because um, I love seeing really long exposure shots that other people do. I'm probably just a little impatient for all that, though. What was part two of the question, uh, Stu? Um, a tutorial about how you print your images. So there's there's obviously the the stuff from Germany, which there's a little bit ago about already. But mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit about other smaller ones. So the ones behind you, where did they come from? Who printed them? Right. That's a good. That's a good idea. I, we do already have one video out there that's public about how my giant prints are made for collectors. You can see that on www.trayracklip.com. But as for how are these these made, um, uh, we. By the way, if you guys go check the vault, uh, I do a 360 tour of my studio where I show off all of my little prints here. These these are just personal prints that I do for the joy of it, and I. I swap out the prints every 
every season, every three months. So now it's summertime here in New Zealand. So we have this kind of green summery thing. You might see I have another green, greenish print back there. Um, I don't sell these or anything. And these actually, it's kind of a fun thing because I don't know if you can see or not, but these are, this is just a piece of paper and there's sort of just like poster board back here or something here. I don't know what it's called, but, and then we have these little clips up here. And so we just shimmy this one off and shimmy a new one off. It's really easy. And it, it's nice too, because it kind of has that studio kind of feel, right? It feels like a, a working place. Um, it's inexpensive, which is great. Framing shit is so expensive. It's really ridiculous. And it takes time and effort. And so I, I love this. I think it's cool. And the prints look great. How, how do I do the prints? I don't know. But I will find out. And that, that would actually make a good passport video. My friend Jackie Rankin here in town, who's a great photographer. She's really good. Um, she prints for me and she is like a master printer. You know, pe people, I don't print myself because I'm dumb. And it's not that I'm dumb, it's that I'm lazy, really. I'm dumb and lazy. <laughs> but, you know, if I'm going to do something, I want to be like an, like an expert at it. I got to be like, if I'm going to start printing, I, I want to be like, really understand what the fuck I'm doing. And I, I don't have that kind of time to research printers and get all the papers and the inks. And it's just, it takes all the time and effort to become good at it. And I just haven't done that. Um, but you know, I think it's, that's why I use Jackie, right? Cause she is an expert. I don't have to be an expert in everything. I just have to know experts. <laughs> um, so what I could do is I go over to Jackie's place and watch her whole printing uh, process, like find out, um, look over there with Osmo, you know, and, um, Hey, go get that 360 camera. I want to show it off too. Uh, we'll go over there and interview her, see what kind of printer she uses, what kind of paper, ink, all that. I guess those are the three main things. You can tell I'm a, I'm a real expert in the way I'm talking While about While Tony's it. doing that, um, there's one final question, I think, for today. Yeah. Um, it's, again, sort of a multi-part, so you can choose which parts you want to talk about. But um, it's going back to the panoramas. So three parts. Do you use any equipment like rails or anything? Second part, how much overlap? And third part, portrait or landscape orientation? And someone was specifically wondering about the museum in France shot. So how you map that right. out in your head. Right. Um, see if you can research when this, or send me up to the Vimeo thing um, or the upcoming passport one. So I'll, I'll give you a little sneak peek. And tell you what day it comes out. Uh, how much overlap? I do a lot of overlap, probably 50%, way more than I need, um, for a few reasons. Uh, one, uh, it definitely makes it line up automatically easier. But the other thing is, because of this method that I described, and I'll give you a little sneak peek of right now, um, I like to have a big, giant brush, right? And I make it 100%. And when I mask and I go over that hard edge, it makes a very long, smooth transition into the other photo, if that makes sense. And most of the time I do portrait. You know, I do portrait, uh, you know, five or six shots across. Um, I think in the example that you'll see coming up in a week or so, whenever it launches, um, I used a 55, 45 millimeter lens on the Hasselblad. I did like five shots across with lots of extreme overlap. Did you send me that Vimeo through? I'm trying to find out what uh, photo uh, it's it's the one from Jack's Jack's Point. You know, the clubhouse at Jack's Point with the remarkables behind it. Oh, I think that's actually live already. I'll track it down. Oh, is it? Send, yes. send me a link to it and I'll I'll pull it up and share my screen. Okay. Um so yeah, so when you're doing these panoramas on a tripod or handheld or rails, which one you do? Oh, you usually well, in the daytime, if I'm outside, almost always handheld. Uh, for the Paris shot, that was definitely on a tripod. Because some of those exposures were like two seconds. And you just can't do that stuff handheld. Um, and I just kind of guess where it is. And I really do a lot, a lot of overlap. Um, way more than necessary. 
you know, because it's just data at some point, you know, why not be overkill? And also, I know that there's these panorama things you can get. Try to send me through that link if you can find it to the blog. I'll share it on the screen. Um, uh, I know there's devices you get on tripods that really let you line everything up like a real pro would. Uh, but that's like another attachment you have to carry around. It's like another big chunk of metal or something here. Ah, here we go. Uh, yeah. I found it. Only beat me to it by about two seconds. <laughs> okay, here, let me close this here. Let me share my screen. Um, well, gosh, I got so many windows open here. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Broadcast professional. Share, share screen. Okay, let me pause this. Ah, oh, got a nice little passport buffer there. Yeah, I think we have got about uh, 10 or 15 passport videos lined up. We're going to release one, one a week, uh, at least one a week, if not more, uh, coming out. So we've got some of those schedules. We've got some good stuff. What day did this come out so people can look at this, if it already came out? Um, uh, if you go to the blog, um, it was the 17th of July um, blog post. Oh, so way back then, eh? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. I think I might have I might have redone this one a second time, actually. So I have to check to see if I've got <laughs> sometimes I write the same blog entry twice and I forget. Um anyway, okay, so as you can see, I'll I'll talk through this here. Um there were seven images here, okay? All taken with 45 millimeter with quite a bit of overlap, okay? So step one, like I described, is I edit them all in um, Lightroom to make sure that they're OK. Or like, for example, what I'll do is I'll edit one, and I'll make it look good. And then I control click on the others, and I say sync settings. OK, so I make them all look as good as I can. OK, and then I bring them into, uh, here we are. Now we are here in Photoshop. Okay, let me pause it here without that menu on there. Here we are in Photoshop, okay? So you can see that um, I pulled them all up on top of each other, and then I auto-aligned them. And you can see these really thick seams between them, right? Okay. Um, and then what I do is I uh, go make a mask on one of them, and I get a big, thick brush, okay? And I... Um, I paint right along the edge, okay? So anyway, put a, put a link to that in the uh, comments if you want to, Stu, and uh, people can go watch this video. There, see how I'm draw, painting on that thing? Look at that. Look at that. I've never seen anyone else use this technique. I'm not saying that I'm awesome because I'm the only one that uses it. I'm just saying it's, it's clearly the best way, and I don't see why no one else has come up with it. See, if you make a really thin brush, you, a small brush, you, get, you see the bit. You've got to make it nice and nice and thick daddy. There. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. OK, cool. Yeah, link, link, the, link the good passport people to that video. Yep, we'll do it. I can't add right. it into the chat just now because it strips out web um, links in live chat. So after the event, I'll, I'll add that in. After the event, cool. All right, guys, uh, I'll leave you with this last thing. We just released a review of this camera yesterday. This is the Insta360 camera. It's great. You attach it to the end of a selfie stick. Um, I said yesterday on social media that I never thought I'd be a selfie stick kind of guy, but I am now. It's cool. You attach it to the end. You screw it on there. Whoop, whoop. And then when it stitches together the video, it erases a selfie stick. So it looks like your, your camera is just like floating out in front of your face, like you have a very small, silent quadcopter around you all the time. So even if you're not interested in particular in this kind of camera for yourself, for taking photos and videos, as Passport members, I think you'll love it because I'm making a ton of videos now with it, right? And so you'll be able to uh, move the camera around and see all different angles. I think, it, I think it's a really fun, innovative viewing experience. So. Hope you guys enjoy. Always trying to come up with new stuff to entertain you guys. Yeah, All right. That one as well. Is we can also do a traditional rectangle video, and we can control where people look and spin the camera around and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's quite 
a different um, experience from that point of view for the viewer as well. So when you were talking in the review about um, erasing, erasing the selfie stick, I was able to spin the camera around and people were spun around while they were watching it and couldn't see the selfie stick, which was a nice little effect. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It's, it's a fun toy, all right. And we contacted, they sent us this as a freebie. They also have an 8K camera, an 8K 360 camera that I'm trying to get them to send us because that'll make it even better. And it will take even more time for Stu and Tane to edit. <laughs> yeah, today, all right. the ones from yesterday, they took yeah. um, seven hours to encode, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. They started yeah. off and walked away. <laughs> I bet. And then we have to get all the footage from here in New Zealand uh, to to Scotland. And so that takes that takes a long time, too. A lot of back office logistics that happen here mm -hmm. at Stuck in Customs. All this hard work we do for you passport people. We love you, though. We hope you love it, too. Um, yeah, if you enjoy it, get another one for a friend for Christmas, a family member. It's kind of like a wine of the month club where you, you, you have to buy your own wine. OK, guys, um, love you all. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I Today, we have our big Stuck in Customs company party. So, Stu, uh, you, you won't be here, but we're going to put your face like in a jar, like in Futurama, and just put awesome. you over by the grill. And you can I'll hand wait out. for the courier coming with the drinks. Yeah, we're going to have barbecuing. It's going to be a good. Yeah, you know who's coming over today? <laughs> uh, Stu, of all people, is. Um, all you know, Kim.com. Yes. All of his all of his kids are coming over to the Stuck and Customs holiday party. We're having friends and neighbors, and actually, I know his wife, um, Mona. So she's coming with all their kids and their fleet of Filipino nannies. The wild kids, I tell you, they really tear it up. It's going to be a wild scene here. The Ratcliffe household, the Stuck and Customs company party. It'll be fun though. That'd be fun. All right, you guys. Um, thanks again for watching. Uh, we've got some hot stuff coming to you this uh, over coming weeks. Hope you continue to enjoy it. Thanks for all the continued feedback. Uh, you guys are the best. I uh, love you, and I will see you next time. Thank you, you Tane. Too. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Stu. Thank you to all the people that you don't see behind the scenes. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>